This is the MedicCast, July 25th, 2011. Transmitters? We don't need no stinking transmitters. This is the MediCast, a podcast for EMS providers by EMS providers, featuring EMS news, products, tips, tricks, and commentary. So grab your gear and glove up. Here's today's show with the pod medic, Jamie Davis. Well, good day and welcome to this week's episode of The Medic Cast. I'm Jamie Davis, the pod medic, and I want to welcome you all to the show this week. Uh, if you watch the video version of the show, of course, you can see that I'm back in the studio this week. The last couple of episodes, we've actually been playing some episodes we recorded back in June at the EMS Culture of Safety Conference. We recorded a couple of live episodes with some special guests there. Carissa Karamanis O'Brien joined me, and we were able to get some great interview segments done there. Of course, if you go to mediccast.tv, you can also see a bunch of other short interviews that Carissa did with some of the other individual participants in this event and some short little four to five minute interview segments. Uh, I think there's going to be about 15 of them when all said and done. So you want to check over there and catch all of those episode segments as well as the regular video episodes of the MedicCast each week. But there's one last couple of things we need to do. After this conference had had their meeting for a full day, the very following morning, they got together and the breakout groups that they had put together to cover some very specific topics having to do with EMS culture of safety came back in and gave their reports. And we were able to sit in and record this. Now this is raw video recorded in a conference setting. There are five different groups that came back in to report. And then they had a wrap-up Q&A and comment period. Now, I want to point out, this is raw. This is the beginnings of this whole concept and really pushing this forward. And they're putting together a, a position statement and a document over the next year to really address how we can make changes in our culture of safety in EMS and develop a true culture of safety. So when you're listening to this, this is what they've come up with in this initial meeting and some of the directions they'd like to see. It is not the end of the document, it is the beginning of this process. And they are still open to comment over at emsculturesafety.org. So I would urge you to head over there and check that out. Before we do that, I do want to remind you, you can find links to everything you see here over at the MedicCast blog. That's MedicCast.com slash blog. You'll find a link to the show notes right at the top of the page, and you can find links to EMS Culture of Safety, to ASAP, and some of the other people involved in this project. I would also encourage you to follow up with me if you want to get back in touch with me with a question, a comment, or a suggestion, you can email me, podmedic at mac.com. You can always, of course, leave a comment over on the MedicCast blog, and you can call in on the voicemail line, 941-306-3342, 941-30-MEDIC. Let's go ahead and get started with the first of our segments here coming right up. So we're going to jump into the first of the segments that was recorded in the wrap-up session at the EMS Culture of Safety Conference back in June in Arlington, Virginia. Again, these are raw ideas coming out of their initial brainstorming sessions. So take them as such. I mean, this isn't gospel and there is all going to be subject to change, but it gives you an idea of what they're looking at and some of the ideas may be able to be instituted now, implemented now to improve safety in your system and in your own personal safety. Starting off, we have EMS, personal health and wellness. This is an issue that I think a lot of us could say we could probably all improve upon. Improving our own health and wellness leads to a safer work environment. And uh, so this is the first section, uh, about 10 or so minutes, and they do a quick presentation on some of their thoughts and ideas on EMS provider health and wellness. Yeah, so everybody gets 10 minutes for report out and then you go fall through the trap door in the floor, okay? <laughs> okay, our, um, our challenge was personal health and wellness and um, we added something to this list that was given to us we feel fatigue and stress is at the top of the list. Mental health, hero mentality, physical fitness, obesity, and smoking. We also added drugs, prescription drugs, and alcohol abuse. 
Thanks, Davina. So our topic area number one, one is where are we now with these topics? And um, we talked about safety and wellness need to be connected. Workers' comps claims are a disincentive while you're out uh, on a workers' comp. Fitness and prerequisite to safety, it, as a pre prerequisite to safety. EMS agencies are um, supporting efforts are not there. We need to have more support from EMS agencies as a whole. There's no standards for the jobs that are tested as we've been, uh, have been set in other industries. In other words, there's no standards to show where we should be health-wise in the first place. Fatigue and sleep deprivation is rampant. And uh, this is one of the biggest challenges I think we have with shift lengths, uh, number of sh uh, consecutive shifts. It's all across the EMS uh, fire rescue uh, world. No agreement on the break point of stress and distress. In other words, stress we know is good to a certain point, but when does that become distress? Not all agencies have pre-employment or ongoing fitness requirements. Uh, most a many agencies require a pre-employment physical exam, but then from there, we have nothing. Before you do that, <laughs> oh, <laughs> just, just saying. <laughs> we have a, we have our safety advisor here. <laughs> so where do we want to be? Uh, we talked about pre-employment physicals and perhaps maybe ongoing an annual physical or at least a health screen. Uh, in, in my world, in, in helicopter EMS, there was a company that um, hadn't screened their people for five, six years and suddenly decided to do a health screen and found out that four of the 12 people actually had hypertension and two had diabetes that they never realized what was going on. So health screens could be very important. Uh, and an ongoing fitness requirement, measure, uh, and have target metrics for injury and illness rates. So we need some measurement tools. Um, local agency has, exec, has, accepta, has exec, acceptable, accountable, <laughs> to monitor uh, for fatigue. This is where we're talking about um, the, um, the management being uh, accountable for looking at fatigue and stress among their workers and monitoring the fatigue and stress. And have safety management systems scaled to the agency size. In the aviation component, safety management systems are very important and are going to be required by the FAA. We can adapt those to the EMS world very easily and it doesn't have to be a large company, it could be a small company. Universal philosophy that this must be solved with no excuses. So we talked about the many excuses volunteers and many of our workers have. Compensation could, should be commensurate with the professionalism to be healthy and well. And again, promoting professionalism will help this whole uh, increase the attitude in health and wellness. Oh, he. I think he wants to take a picture. <laughs> okay. okay, so how do we get there? We need to get people to admit it's a problem. Um, I really feel the elephant in the room is fatigue. People don't want to talk about it. It has a lot to do with uh, economics as well because many of our people work two, two, three jobs to support a family. So they're working 24, 48 sh hour shifts in a row. It's a big impact, not just on safety of the personnel, but the patient safety as well. So we need to get people to look at that. Awareness and education is very important. Increase motor vehicle, motor vehicle safety. No more uh, NHTSA exemptions from FMVSS drivers like FMSA, FMCSA. 
So no more exemptions for ambulance, ambulances. Providers must care and promote wellness, physical and mental, develop uh, pre and ongoing employment regulations. Um, for example, policies like uh, checking driver's records and driving records uh, should be important. An effort to eliminate cause, causes and excuses. We hear all kinds of excuses about, well, I didn't get uh, enough uh, rest or I, I'm overweight because, and those kind of things. We have to eliminate some of those excuses. Okay, strategies to make change one bit, one bite at a time is, is going to be helpful. We realize we can't introduce all of these concepts overnight. Stop glorifying stupidity. Dia, that was yours. <laughs> introduce new thinking in the next generation. So as, as we have new people coming into the field, make sure we introduce safety topics, topics of health and wellness. Look at Shell's Hearts and Minds. This is uh, Shell Oil Company has a very excellent uh, production of Hearts and Minds that would be pertinent to us in the EMS field. Demand personal responsibility and accountability to yourself and to your peers. Create a national repository for all events. We talked a lot about data and the fact that we need data, but we don't even have the definitions to describe what that data set would be. Do we know what an EMS ambulance even is? And how do we start creating those definitions and getting the information so we can have uh, the denominator? Plus, we got air. So. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and get funding and a training education is important. <laughs> Obstacles. Uh, squishy myths in preventive medicine. In other words, let's stick to the science and what we know about health and wellness. We need a national vision so that everybody is on the same, uh, same wavelength for that. Uh, dollars are, and everybody wants more dollars, more funding is needed, um, except that we need to find innovative ways to use the dollars we have because Tom pointed out very, uh, very well that we can't expect to see a lot more dollars since the healthcare industry itself is, is uh, struggling. So we need to look at what we have, how we can make that best work, and what we can do to promote health and wellness. Um, 300 years of tradition, where we hear people say all the time, but that's the way I did it, that's the way I've always done it, my father did it this way. We don't wanna hear that anymore. No penalties for failure, just culture. All the principles of just culture are very important. No, we don't have national metrics and we operate in silos. So we have spe specific fire rescue, we have EMS, we have all these different silos that need to come together. So we just heard from EMS Health and Wellness group decisions and some of the discussion they had and the points that they came up with, with when they brainstormed. The next topic is patient safety and wellness. What are we going to do to improve or what can we do to improve the culture of safety surrounding patient safety and specifically medical errors? Something we all think about, I think all the time, worrying about making a mistake with our patients. What can you do to change the environment in your workplace to improve medical errors and overall patient safety. Let's check out the discussion group's ideas from the EMS Culture of Safety Conference. I make that error all the time. Our group was, uh, was charged with dealing with, uh, with uh, issues surrounding patient safety and uh, where we, uh, pr with particular attention to medical errors, to uh, transparency and self-reporting, which we'll talk about a little bit, and the transportation, vehicle accidents and drops as they pertain to patients because uh, I believe another group is going to is going to address that same issue as it pertains to providers. So that's the that's the basis for where we are. Where we are now, 
Um, right now, we, we really don't have, again, and you're going to hear this over and over, great, uh, uh, great data regarding adverse patient effects uh, because, and, you know, in the, the, uh, as far as things that are preventing that from happening, we discussed yesterday punitive systems that, uh, that really discourage people from reporting adverse effects. And in some cases, there's a regulatory component to that, that is the regulations that, that people are working under require that, that there be a punitive action ba you know, uh, based on what happens, which further uh, prevents people from reporting things that they should be reporting. So we, we kind of lack data, and, what we, and, and I'm sort of mixing sections here, but what we really need is a transparent system where people can report without fear of, uh, of uh, retribution. Uh, and a, a good near-miss system, some of which were, were, are in the works, and hopefully they'll be coming, uh, coming toward us soon. Uh, training is always an issue, training in, in, uh, as far as the medical aspects of things, preventing errors, and in terms of transportation, how much training do we do on lifting and moving patients? And uh, the answer to that is, uh, is precious little. One of the things that's happened now, if you're, if you're a, an old goat like me, you remember everybody had a Model 30 cot and you only had to train them once to use a Model 30 cot. And whatever truck you got into, was the, it was gonna be the same. Nowadays, there are so many different pieces of equipment that it's possible for an individual to get on a truck that has a different kind of a stretcher, which can ultimately lead in a stretcher drop just because of their unfamiliarity with the apparatus. So the, the training kind of has, has to be ongoing. And, and what we discussed was training really needs to start. There needs to be a stronger safety component in initial EMT and initial paramedic training so that, uh, so that people get on board. If we're, gonna tr if we're going to change a culture, one of the ways to change that culture is to, to get the new people on board as they come in and not have to change their habits, but to start, to start them on the, on the, uh, on the right road. Um, uh, with regard to, uh, yeah, qual uh, thank you, quality, uh, quality improvement systems. Some systems have very good quality improvement programs, other systems don't. We need to standardize that. We need to make sure that there are quality systems in place, quality improvement systems in place, and good supervision. And we have to, we have to, uh, to make sure that our, the people who supervise our people in the streets know what, they're, know what they're doing and are supervising them properly. One of the things we talked about within the current culture is the, is the, is the phenomenon that we put somebody through school and then they, they hit the street and, and get out with an FTO and the FTO says, okay, now we're gonna show you how it's really done in the field. And we need to keep that from happening. One of the ways we keep that from happening is trained FTOs and not everybody, not everybody actually trains their people who act as field training officers. It just comes, it falls to the person who is most senior or or who grabbed the short straw in some, in some cases. And we really need to provide training for field training officers so that they're training people to do what we want them to do and not, uh, not telling them how to shortcut and perhaps do, uh, to engage in unsafe practices. We talk about uh, uh, stretcher drives. Well, we talk about transportation and, and things that can happen to patients. Um, and there are a number of things that, uh, that we recognize there. Number one, in a, in a vehicle crash, it's very likely if it's a serious crash that the current mounting systems for cots will not hold the cot in place. If, the, if you've seen the NIOSH video, you've seen that in action and it's not uncommon that the, the, the current stretcher mounting systems just won't, uh, won't hold up against the significant crash. The cot comes loose, the patient comes loose. Strapping systems, uh, uh, the same way. We, you know, we think that those over-the-shoulder straps provide an extra measure of, uh, of security. However, again, if you've seen that NIOSH video, you know that the patient moves a significant amount because of the way those straps are mounted on the stretcher. So there are some engineering changes that, uh, that hopefully, need, hopefully will be made that we can, uh, that we can push for in that, w within that realm. Uh, I already mentioned unfamiliarity with, uh, with stretchers. Um, and again, going back to the training thing, how one, how one moves a stretcher, how much time do we spend on that? Uh, you know, it's, it seems to be inherently unsafe to move these things in the up position. But from an ergonomic standpoint, if you're not gonna ruin your back, you're gonna want that thing in the up position rather than on the ground to where you're tweaking your back every time you pull it. So there's a, there's a disconnect there that uh, some engineering should be able to get around and should be able to, uh, to give us the best of, best of both worlds. Um, what else do we have? What, have I what am I missing? Um, 
So, oh yeah, uh, in addition to, to equipment, secure, uh, uh, stretchers, securing equipment. Lots of people are injured by loose equipment. In many cases, that's because we don't have adequate systems on board the ambulances to secure the equipment. In some cases, the, the, even the doors to the cabinets immediately fly open in a crash, uh, depending on how they're engineer, engineered. Those are things that, again, from an engineering standpoint, need to, be, need to be looked at and corrected, and hopefully the NFPA is looking at some of these things as a part of their effort in, uh, in creating standards for an ambulance. The other thing is our people need to be diligent about securing everything that's inside the ambulance, everything from a radio to a cell phone, anything that can fly around, can fly around and hit the patient, including the other people in the back of the ambulance. And that brings us to the, uh, to the issue of how do we secure our people in an, in an ambulance and allow them to work on a patient. And you know and I know that in, in today's current standard ambulance, you cannot be belted and provide patient care from, the, from the, uh, uh, the bench seat. You just can't do it. There has to be a way to modify the design of the ambulance. And, and currently, I think the most popular thing that's being looked at is forward-facing seats in lieu of the, the, uh, uh, the bench seat and uh, placing that stretcher closer to the provider so the provider doesn't have to come, have to become unbelted. Uh, so, you know, that, that would prevent that provider from flying around and ultimately landing on top of the, uh, landing on top of the patient. Again, we have very little data on the number of stretcher drops. Uh, generally, it's only reported if, there, if some injury is, uh, is incurred. If it's not incurred, hey, uh, was it, did anybody see me do that? No, okay. And, and, down the hall we go, no harm, no foul. I think we talked about that yesterday morning, didn't we? So that's basically where we came out. Uh, let me know if I'm leaving anything out here, but I think that pretty much covers our, uh, our discussion on the topic. So if there are any questions, I'll take them. Otherwise, I'll pass off to number three. So one, one of the things we do want to capture is you know, what are your strategies to make change happen? Uh, what, you know, going back to our mission of well, there are a couple of, I think a couple of strategies. Number one, you know, it all comes down to training. Uh, again, doing initial training with people to help them avoid these medication errors. Uh, another strategy would be developing and reporting systems that are non-punitive so that people do report so that we can gather the kind of data that we need to, to, uh, to address these issues. Uh, the training needs to include not only with regard to medical errors, but just with, with errors in practice like stretcher drops and things like that, how to safely, move, how to safely lift and move patients uh, and, and keep from, from dropping them on the ground. Um, some, you know, one thing I left out was pro with regard to protocols, standardized protocols. Uh, we, we had people in our group who from county to county, from city to city, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction have different protocols and you have people working in, in, in multiple settings, uh, the, the previous speaker talked about the number of hours that people, people work, and the fact is a lot of people in EMS, because of the wages that we pay, have to work more than one job, and in many cases they're working in more than one jurisdiction with two, two different sets of protocols, which is a setup for errors. So one of, the, one of the things that would help with that would be more increased standardization of protocols. Politically, that's a really hot potato in some areas, and we talked about that too that uh, you know, there, there could be gunfire over that. But uh, um, you know, hopefully we can, we can move more toward that. And then finally, engineering uh, issues, ergonomic, uh, uh, ergonomic information, engineering issues from the manufacturers, making a, you know, a, a more stable stretcher, uh, a better stre stretcher mounting platform so that these things don't come loose, and paying attention to those things, and providing the appropriate hold downs and things for uh, equipment that's in the back of the ambulance so it doesn't go flying around and hit people. Okay, thank you. So we've talked about provider health and wellness, patient safety, medical errors. Our final segment for this week's episode from the EMS Culture of Safety Conference is going to be a look at practitioner safety. You know, when we think about EMS culture of safety, I think one of the things that primarily comes to mind is our safety. I talk about it here all the time when we talk about motor vehicle accidents, line of duty deaths, and things like that. What can we do to improve the safety of ourselves, both in the back of the ambulance, but throughout the process of our EMS days, whether we're in station, on the way to a call, on the way back from the hospital, and everything in between, we need to really be doing things to improve our own practitioner safety. And the third discussion group that came to present their brainstormed ideas at the EMS Culture of Safety Conference looked at this topic. And we'll wrap up this week's episode with that. Hello, my name is Anthony Conradi. I'm group three. 
Um, the benefit of going first is that all your ideas are new. The benefit of going last is that there's a significant amount of BS that's involved with it, so I'm in the middle, so I have to buff this turd just right. <laughs> that being said, <laughs> we didn't attack it like you guys did, all right, uh, the previous two groups, which is, is, which is a little bit different. We looked at this more general, and uh, hold on a second. And I had to retype this while I was in the back, so I do apologize because I was trying to write all the notes. <coughs> Great tools, but I have no idea how to use this. Okay. Um, we didn't look at these individually. We looked at more of it in general. And the key concept that I think the team was, was really trying to emphasize was information. How we process it, how we gather it, uh, how we make it valuable. Um, Specific uh, to our group, it has seemed like with the information, uh, we should be collecting a lot more than we currently do in a format that's a little bit more conducive to what we do. Now, there's a lot of research we can go out there and grab. The question is, can we really make it down to earth for our regular practitioners, for our um, supervisors, managers, medical oversight? And uh, that's the biggest issue. And we have to, we can also pull from other um, uh, professionals, uh, professions, um, and make it somewhat applicable to ours. So we have to come up with a, a method that's a little bit more conducive to gathering that information. <clears throat> we have to be able to disseminate that information in a structured format so that it's just not one document fits all. If you're a practitioner, this is what's important to you. If you're a supervisor, this is what's important to you. If you're a CEO, director, this. Medical oversight, this. So this way, you know where to look in that document. And it'll have solutions associated with each of those levels. So we first have to identify some sort of standard format. Now, now you can pull that down. <laughs> um, we have to come up with some more of a standard format. We have to tell the people what to measure, how to measure it, why they're measuring it, what they're going to do with it analysis-wise, what are they being benchmarked against, why is it important to benchmark, should be standardized definitions, um, and we have to prioritize the information itself. What may be relative to one, uh, you know, relatively important to one entity could have no relation whatsoever to another. There could be agencies that never ever have back injuries and agencies that have tremendous number of back injuries. We have to format that structure so it's important to them. Voluntary versus required reporting. Now, there was some debate, and I think the general um, agreement between the group was to make it voluntary. And the question is, well, once it's voluntary, who's going to buy into it? Well, that's where we actually have to make the information provided back have some value. Add the value, make it worthwhile. If I'm going to give you this information, this is what you're going to give back to me. You're going to give me back recommendations, processes, procedures, something to make it theirs once they get it. And as the people start to value that, more people will join in and actually, jo and the voluntary may become mandatory just because they have to compete with everybody else. A final topic that was brought in, which we really weren't able to actually discuss uh, at length, was intake information and coordination with information coming in on the initial call so that information can be disseminated out to the groups to, in, uh, to uh, aid safety. How we can get all that information up front so that people can take action earlier. So that was something we didn't re we really get involved in. Uh, it just was briefly <laughs> added on at, at the end. It, it did uh, deserve to have a lot more attention. That being general, uh, that was just the general attack with information. <coughs> We moved on, uh, we had quite a lively debate on how to implement, what's boring us, what, what's blocking us, how are we going to do all this? And it's quite extensive what we came up with. Um, we always say that safety saves us money. It's going to cost us up front. It's going to um, be better for us on the back end, but yet we don't have anything really saying that to our providers, our managers. This is what you're going to save. This is the process that's going to save you. This is the process that's going to prevent. 
and be beneficial to you. There has to be some sort of cost-benefit analysis that's a lot more in-depth than we currently give them. Don't reinvent the wheel was mentioned numerous times, but we could have to keep those comparisons um, to what is related uh, just to our industry. We have to disseminate that information, and it includes just about every sort of aspect, whether it's paper for us all over 40, or whether it's an iPad application for anybody under, under 30. So we have to focus on multiple ways of getting the information out, data collection we already covered, coordination of existing organizations, uh, a, the lead federal agency or lead agency in EMS was something that was mentioned there, but there's no standardization of practices, um, funding, uh, funding availability, all these things that are relevant to safety. Um, but the biggest thing that we were talking about was the construction of the document that is going to come out of this that's going to alter the way we teach EMS education. That it's not just a chapter in a book. Uh, oh, patient safety. Um, oh, yeah, this is what you should look at. That it's integral to every aspect of the, docu of the, uh, the book, the textbooks, the education requirements. So that instead of just doing psychomotor skills, of, you know, education, this is how you start an IV. It'll now incorporate, well, this is what could potentially happen when you start an IV. This is what could ha happen to the patient. And form a risk assessment basis of everything our providers do. Is this something that's going to be easy? No, it's not. But at least it's something that we haven't done before that's going to give the providers a better basis of making decisions. So that whole basis of the education is going to have to permeate the whole document, you know, the, the new cur the curricula changes, getting the textbooks to buy in and change that to meet our requirements for safety. It's a, it's a big task on its own. But I think uh, we all thought that it was going to be something that was going to be unbelievably beneficial, that every aspect of their education, whether it's cardiac care, or whether it's special operations, or whether it's um, uh, EMT well-being, right? that safety aspect is always going to be discussed and they're going to assess risk at that basis. So uh, one other and the final thing was developing a core set of values that everybody follows. This is what we believe we should value. I thought we talked about it. I don't see anything on the list yet. So I'm hoping that's something we can do right away. So, but unless you have any other questions, that's a general format we went through. OK, thank you. And that's going to wrap up this week's episode of the MedicCast. I want to thank everybody for checking out the show this week. I'm really excited that we got invited to come in and join the American College of Emergency Physicians and their partners in the federal government, including the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Health and Human Services, um, the Health Resources Services Agency, uh, all those acronyms, those alphabet soup names that we hear about so often associated with EMS, and coming to talk about the EMS Culture of Safety Conference. I would like to tell you that there's one more segment coming up next week to look at the wrap-up and final two presentations from the discussion groups, and I hope you'll tune in for that. Again, no matter who you are and where you are in your EMS career, whether you're a student, whether you're brand new starting out, or you've been around for a long time, I really think there's something you can take away from this discussion to improve the way you handle safety in your ambulance, in your personal life, and in how you deal with your patients. So I would listen to these episodes very carefully and keep them maybe bookmarked on your listening device, your computer, your MP3 player, your phone, whatever, so that you can maybe go back and revisit them from time to time because culture of safety is just that, it's a culture. And that means we really need to change the way we think about these things and frequently remind ourselves of what safety means. In the meantime, I welcome your comments. I really love to hear back from you about what your thoughts are on this initiative. You can reach me here by going over to the MedicCast blog, medicast.com slash blog. You'll find links to everything we've talked about, and you can leave a comment right there on the show notes page, and I would urge you to do that. You can also reach me by email, podmedic at mac.com. I love to hear from you. I try really hard to respond back to everybody's emails, and I really want to hear your thoughts about this particular issue. You know, 
I want each and every one of you to be safe and have a long and healthy career in the EMS sector. And I also want you to make sure that you're not having as any bumps in the road, like patient safety problems and things like that. They do happen from time to time, but if we can improve the culture of safety, we can change the way we deal with those situations and how we reduce the, the amount of risk that's involved. So I want to hear back from you, so send those comments in. Of course, you can also call in on the voicemail line, 941-306-3342, 941-30-MEDIC. Last but not least, don't forget to catch up with me via the social media routes. You can catch me over on Facebook at facebook.com slash podmedic and on Twitter, twitter.com slash podmedic. And don't forget the MedicCast fan page available over on Facebook, and that's facebook.com slash medicast. That's it for me. I'm going to go ahead and close out the show. You may find that we've got some of these episodes, the video versions, posted over on YouTube, so you can search for MedicCast over there as well. And I look forward to hearing back from you always here on the MedicCast. In the meantime, and appropriate for the EMS culture of safety discussion, I'll wrap up the show as I always do and remind each and every one of you to remember, scene safety, BSI.